selected members of the jury. Um, my name is Ellen Hoffman. I'm from Munich, and I'm delighted to defend the idea on trial today that cryo-balloon ablation is the best approach for ablation of atrial paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. I'm particularly delighted because I have an incredibly um, good defense team at my site, and, uh, which is Rob Cowell from Dallas, which is uh, going to testify, and also Jim Irvin from Tampa. So um, that will help a lot. And uh, talking about the prosecutor today, Dr. Hendricks, um, Gerd, you have a very good starting point because you're advocating RF energy uh, and thereby you're holding the holy grail of AF ablation. And this is supported by a statement, consensus statement of the HRS that says that RF energy is by far the dominant energy source that has been used for catheter ablation. That looks very good, and I know exactly how you feel, although you claim that you're a very objective, rational person. But uh, look, I'm not chicken-hearted because I have all the good arguments on my side. And uh, I make it very straightforward and address with my statements the two most important issues, which are, of course, first, efficacy, and second, safety, and of course, efficacy. The balloon is a very intriguing, predestinated tool to create a circular lesion, a continuous circular lesion, which might be durable for PV isolation. And cryoenergy is just the safer energy as compared to RF. So we'll start off with a very beautiful example of a single freeze isolation of a left common ostium. And on the left side, you see that the balloon is positioned via one single transeptal puncture over the wire, uh, which is also positioning and mapping, circular mapping wire. And on the right side, you see these beautiful PV potentials and uh, the start of the cryoablation. Then after uh, 40 seconds here, you see that this is the PV potential, beautifully seen here. Then after 40 second, seconds, a delay. And one beat later, you see complete isolation of this uh, left common ostium. So, and what I also want to mention is that the time to isolation that we uh, looked at uh, most recently is the first predictor, not only for procedural success, but also for long-term success. So this is important information. And if you look at the recently published meta-analysis from Android and colleagues, uh, looking at the one-year freedom from AF of 73%, that compares favorably to the global RF literature. But, which is very amazing, look at this consistency over these five studies. If you think of all the published data of, of all the RF studies, the range of success comes from 30 to almost 100% success rate. So I think this is a, a very impressive detail we have to mention here. Our own experience uh, is based on 424 procedures in 348 patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and we can report also a 71% success rate, and we do numerous four to seven days holder which is a very important issue that our prosecutor likes to make very often. So you see, this is a 16 months follow-up, very good uh, results here. In Germany, cryo-balloon ablation is a very established procedure, and I give you here the results and data from the German Prospective Ablation Registry, including 4,002 patients uh, between included between 2007 and 2011 with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And what you can see here is almost a quarter of the patients were underwent already cryo-balloon ablation. So this is German data and the results compared to the 3,029 patients undergoing RF ablation were comparable. However, however worldwide experience uh, includes already 30,000 patients uh, treated in 400 centers over the last six years. And by the end of this year, over 50,000 procedures will be performed. One of the first data uh, containing the head-to-head -head comparison, uh, 90 patients here in the cryo group, these are data from Wynne Davis's group, and 53 patients in the RF group revealed 
a significantly shorter procedure time and fluoroscopy time. And the results here at one year freedom of the F with 75% approximately were uh, almost equal. So the group concluded from, their, uh, from this study that PV isolation can be achieved in less than two hours by a simple cryoablation protocol with excellent results after a single intervention. I'm honestly very surprised that these efficacy data are so comparable. If you look at this beautiful results from also from London, from the Imperial College, and what you can see here on the right side, these are our patients who underwent cryoballoon ablation, laser, robotic, and conventional RF ablation procedures. And what the, the group performed was left atrial uh, gadolinium cardiac imaging. And you can see here, this, after the cryoballoon procedure, a beautifully uniform circular lesion around the PVs. And here, with the other procedures, rather scattered lesions around the PVs. So, I don't know, Gerhard. Uh, things, are getting, things are getting a little more difficult, and I feel, much, I feel much better already. However, it doesn't count how I feel, how our patients feel. That's important, and this very good study here by Defaye and others showed that the procedure, cryoprocedure, is much better tolerated than the RF procedure, and they compared the usage of anesthetic and sedative medication and found a significantly higher usage of these drugs in the RF group. So the second issue is coming up, and our prosecutor raised concern himself, which is very credible. If, if you look at his paper concerning his high volume experience in 1,000 procedures under patients undergoing RF uh, ablation, and he says that the main finding of this study is that AF ablation still has a considerable com complication rate, even in experienced high-volume centers, and despite the significant progress that has been made in that field. Importantly, a number of these complications may be immediately life-threatening or result in severe residues. And uh, he has the merit with his group that he was the first to publish this devastating complication of a left atrial uh, esophageal fistula. So this is important. And safety, of course, with cryoballoon, the phrenic nerve palsy is often raised, the issue, and uh, end rate published an only 0.37% persistent PNP. Our own experience in these, three, uh, in these 424 procedures, uh, one phrenic nerve palsy didn't resolve uh, after one year, four patients resolved within one year, and procedural PNP was a rate of 10%. So PNP commonly resolves and is associated with very few symptoms. If you compare the overall major complication rates, here the Carpato survey, Dr. Hendrick's data, and the meta-analysis from Android, there is a 3.3% percent major complication rate uh, reported in the Capato survey, 2.4 percent in the proc prosecutor's experience, and 1.4 percent, so much better, in the cryo experience. And what you have to, since we're talking about uh, atrial esophageal fistulas, you have to note that there is a 6 to 20 times higher, or 6 to 20 fold higher rate of fistulas in RF versus cryo. So now, uh, Gerd, I would like to quote you for the last time, with this rising experience and technical developments, one would ex anticipate, that's what he said, a decline in adverse events. However, this does not seem to be the case, and you have to be careful not to lose the holy grail now. If you don't know the right answer. Stop. What is your name? Sir Galahad of Camelot. What? Is your quest? I seek the grail. What is your favorite color? Blue. No. <laughs> Holy moly, dear, I told you what the right answer is. I prefer the cryo balloon. That would have been the right answer, and uh, there's good reasons for that. It creates continuous lesion, procedure time is short, patient comfort is high, freedom from AF 
is equally effective and the safety profile is very favorable. And this is my last statement. Cryo is safe and cool. I'm afraid, Gerd, you will lose your tool. Thank you very much. Um, one of the complaints about the, or one of the criticisms about the cryo balloon is that the extent of the lesion is not the same as, as wide circumferential um, RF ablation. Uh, actually, the poster session, there's a poster session going on downstairs and compares cryo balloon, wide circumferential RF, uh, segmental RF, and the PVAC. And um, the lesions for the cryo balloon are identical to wide circumferential RF. So. I didn't have time to put that into my argument, but um, it's amazing when you do a cryo balloon and you put a lasso or circular catheter up into the pulmonary veins, it is not uncommon to see absolutely nothing. Uh, I've never seen that with RF, uh, but I frequently see it with the cryo balloon, and I think that's a reflection of the extent of the lesion we create. Now, we've all seen cardio maps, and this is a cardio map of a 28 millimeter balloon post cryo balloon ablation. And you can see the extent of the lesion is what you would expect with a wide circumferential ablation. Um, do we have any evidence of that this is what we really see? Yes, actually, um, this is one of my patients who had a cryo balloon procedure done a year earlier and needed open heart surgery. So I asked the surgeon to actually film the inside of the left atrium. And what you're looking at right here is the right inferior pulmonary vein. This pump sucker is in the left inferior pulmonary vein, and you'll see a nice discrete white line right here, which is the extent of the lesion. And you saw the same thing around each of the four pulmonary veins. So this is actually the inside of a human left atrium a year out. Uh, granted, he, we did use the 28 millimeter balloon, but you can see the extent of the lesion. Now, um, we had a very interesting case recently in, in Tampa, and uh, this is a lady who was uh, 65 years old who was um, going in and out of AFib continuously and she had wet macular degeneration and retinal bleed. Uh, she had failed amio miserably and was, was feeling terrible. And um, because of the retinal hemorrhage, the ophthalmologist was a little hesitant to, to um, have us do an ablation. Since uh, cryo leaves less clot uh, is one of the reasons I chose to ablate her with the, the um, cryo balloon. And what I want you to notice is right here, um, this wide, fractionated, funny looking P wave. Uh, we did the right, or we did the left superior pulmonary vein, and in the first freeze with the left inferior, she stopped having atrial fibrillation. Um, with the cryo balloon, we obviously ablate all of the veins. So we ablated the right superior pulmonary vein, and we were using the Achieve catheter. And for those of you that don't know about the Achieve, it's a circular catheter that goes through the balloon and can actually record uh, electrical activation within the pulmonary vein. And something very unusual happened. Uh, these are the pacing spikes for pacing phrenic <laughs> nerve. And you'll notice that we're coming along with a wide P wave, and right here it becomes narrow. This occurred six seconds after pulmonary vein isolation from the Achieve catheter. So this narrowing of the P wave had nothing to do with isolation of that pulmonary vein. Now, if I'm giving this talk in Oklahoma, we ablated a GP. If I'm giving it in um, Los Angeles, we ablated a cafe. Um, clearly, whatever caused this narrowing of the pulmonary vein had nothing to do with fixing the AFib, had nothing to do with isolation of this vein. Uh, it had to do with ablating farther beyond the ostium of this pulmonary vein. Um, and now you can see the final result of a nice narrow QRS. So um, there's absolutely no question that the extent of the ablation, contrary to popular belief, is not osteal. It truly is antral. Uh, and it's a wonderful tool to have um, to fix AFib. Rob is going to talk to you about what the true results of the studies are and compare head to head. Thank you. tribunal at the risk of being in contempt. Uh, I'm going to restrict my early comments to uh, data and scrutiny from the FDA and comments they've made as well. So um, what I'd like to do first is talk about the STOP-AF trial and then bring in some data from the Thermocool trial as well. 
So as many of you know, the STOP AF trial, which was the trial that the FDA used to approve the cryoballoon, was a randomized trial looking at paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in patients who had failed at least one FDA-approved antiarrhythmic drug, and it randomized patients in a two-to-one manner. It was, a, it, it was, until Cabana surpassed it recently, the largest trial, uh, randomized trial of atrial fibrillation. So 163 patients were randomized to the ablation arm versus 82 in the drug arm. There was an initial therapy of either a new drug or a change in dosing or ablation and a blanking period during which 19 percent of the patients received a second cryoablation. They could not have RF uh, or um, uh, optimization of an antiarrhythmic drug or a new antiarrhythmic drug if needed. Seventy-nine percent of those patients um, crossed over to the ablation arm. And I think one thing of, of great importance is the intensive level of follow-up done on these patients. And then we'll bring that up further. So what was the endpoint in STOP AF? It was a combined endpoint that was called freedom from chronic treatment failure that included no detectable AF outside the blanking period. You could be on a previously failed antiarrhythmic drug, a new drug, or any other ablation outside the blanking period, RF or cryo, was considered a failure, and it was any AF, symptomatic or not. You could not use non-study drugs. You could not do any other interventions. and you had to have achieved the acute endpoint of pulmonary vein isolation in at least three veins to get to the chronic endpoint. When we look at follow-up, there was a high degree of follow-up among all these different studies in the cohort. I'll point out, for example, MRI or CT scan at 12 months was 96 percent in this, in this group. And this is the endpoint. 69.9 uh, percent of the patients in the ablation arm achieved the freedom from uh, or the treatment success endpoint versus only 7.3 percent of the drug arm. Um, this again is chronic. There were two patients who were acute failures who had only two veins isolated who went on to be chronic treatment successes but couldn't be counted. That would have put the result at 71 percent. Among those patients, 98 percent reached an acute success point. 97.6 percent of patients had all veins isolated and 83 percent had veins isolated with the balloon only. And I'll, as I mentioned later, this has occurred among operators, many of whom had never touched the balloon before the first counted case. Single ablation success rate was 60.1 percent. Um, I want to talk about, uh, um, Dr. Hoffman talked about complications. I want to bring up one in particular which was not covered, which is pulmonary vein stenosis. It was counted at 3.1 percent, seven of 228 ablated subjects. We included all crossover patients in the analysis. Um, five were symptomatic and two asymptomatic, and two were symptomatic and counted as serious adverse events. And in fact, these two had serious PV stenoses, um, neither of which were symptomatic at the end of the trial. But this could be the result if you actually put the balloon squeezed too deep in the vein. And in fact, this was an image from one of the cases that led to pulmonary vein stenosis, so we know the, the reason why uh, the, the lesion was delivered too deep. But I think that more importantly, to understand why the number was so high, you have to understand how pulmonary vein stenosis was defined in this trial. And in fact, STOP AF defined it as a 75 percent cross-sectional area reduction. That is equivalent to a 50 percent diameter reduction. This is not an excuse. It's the fault of the trial designers. If you look at Thermacool as well as all other trials, typically it's a 70 percent reduction in cross-sectional area, which means, excuse me, in diameter, which means a 91 percent reduction in cross-sectional area. So what happens if you apply STOP AF criteria to Thermacool? Well, in fact, one of 22 patients, uh, one, one of 22 studied patients uh, in that trial had pulmonary vein stenosis, or 3 percent, which is the same as STOP AF. I think the other thing worth noted is there were over 100 ablated patients, but at 12 months, only 22 were studied with a CT or MRI, so we really don't know what happened to most of the other patients in that trial. Uh, and as I mentioned, 96 percent of the STOP AF patients had that endpoint looked at. So let's move and look at Thermacool a bit. We don't have any head-to-head -head randomized trials. I think doing that is fraught with problems, but at least we have two trials out there that the FDA scrutinized to lead to approval, and they were designed in somewhat similar manners. They were two-to-one randomizations of ablation versus drug, similar age, similar degree of male patients, similar burden of atrial fibrillation. These were very symptomatic patients. 
Somewhat similar dr uh, drug failures, nodal agents were allowed to be failed in, in, in Thermacool, similar left atrial dimension, similar amount of hypertension, uh, a little bit different uh, early degree of early persistent patients, but, but not clear that that's significant. Um, if you look at the outcomes reported in, by each group, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves for Thermacool and STOP-AF, similar endpoints, 69 and STOP-AF, 64 for Thermacool. The incremental difference between drug was different, uh, was more favorable in STOP AF, but again, hard to know what that really means. But let's look a little deeper at what went on in each of these trials and what was measured. Um, again, 69 versus 66, very similar. But what was the protocol definition? STOP AF was freedom from any AF. Thermocool was symptomatic AF as the final protocol. How much AF was looked for? In STOP AF, there are 35.5 median number of TTMs in the patients over the nine-month follow-up out of the blanking period. In Thermocool, it was 13.3%. And if you look at the lesions delivered, they were different. So a, a subset of about 81 patients or 82 patients in Thermocool had a complete definition of what lesions were delivered. And among those patients, 28% received linear lesions in the left atrium. That was not allowed in the STOP AF protocol. You could treat the veins, you could do cabotricuspid isthmus, and that was it. And again, there was a difference in extensive experience in thermocool versus minimal experience in the STOP AF group. And so how does that end up when you look at the different centers and how they perform? Well, if you look at the two highest enrolling centers in thermocool versus the two highest enrolling centers in STOP AF, Success rate is similar, very impressive, 87, 86% identical. The one difference is in Thermacool, that represented almost half the enrollment, whereas in STOP AF, it represented less than a third. So let's look at what the FDA said about what happens if you look at the top enrolling center in Thermacool. So 49 subjects out of uh, 150 were enrolled at one center that reported a 100% success rate. If you look at all the other centers combined, 47% success rate in the Thermocool trial versus 18% with drug. How about STOP AF? Can can Canadian centers and U.S. sites were virtually <laughs> identical. If you looked at the success rate of the top two sites, I mentioned 86, but all others were 62, very close to the, uh, because they had 72% of the total, very close to the total group. So there's clearly a learning curve. But how quickly do you learn how to do this procedure? So this was an analysis uh, we did initially, worked on by Jeremy Ruskin, and we, we uh, took, took off from there. This was the STOP AF cohort divided into quartiles of procedure experience. So what you're looking at is the success rate from each center enrolling for the first and second procedure, the third through fifth procedure, the sixth through eleventh, and the twelfth procedure and beyond similar numbers of patients in each quartile. And what you see is this very impressive improvement in success as we learned how to do this procedure, 90% in the final group. Well, the big question is, well, you just ablated more. You just touched up a little more. Well, in fact, that wasn't the case. Repeat ablation was lowest in this last most successful <laughs> quartile, and touch-ups with the freezer max was also lowest in this last most successful quartile. If you look, there's a equivalent learning curve for single procedure success rate, which came in at 78%, which is exactly the number that Wynn Davies showed. And if you look at off-drug success, single procedure, 70%, a very reasonable outcome. If you look at serious adverse events in the fourth quartile, there were zero. Again, not statistically significant in any way, but a trend. So we can now further look at ways, as Dr. Hoffman pointed out, of making this procedure even more palatable to do and, and, and uh, efficient using a transluminal circular mapping guide catheter that goes through the catheter and allowing for simple transeptal punk, uh, uh, procedures. And she showed a nice example. This is another of en bloc isolation, not picking off fascicles one at a time with progressive delay and then isolation. In our experience, you can use this catheter with stable balloon positions 100% of cases, 100% of the time. This is out of 97 veins with 74% of the time real time pulmonary vein isolation. And what we found, this is, was published, shown downstairs this morning, is if you got isolation on the single lesion and did your bonus lesion, that was all you had to do at 78% of the veins. That doesn't mean you had to touch up, you just had to do additional potential, uh, potential freezes at other veins. So 
In summary, the cryo balloon is an effective tool for ablation of symptomatic paroxysmal fib. Uh, while there's no direct randomized comparisons that exist, the STOP AF data compares very favorably to that of Thermacool. There's a rapid learning curve, and further advances have made real time electrograms in a single transeptal strategy a viable and effective approach. So we will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much to the protagonists. Um, at this point, uh, I'm not sure I probably we want to clarify any points or any questions for the protagonists from the Court of Justice, or we go direct to the panel. Can I know the reason why the, the results of Stop AF haven't been published in, in extended version till now? Sure. Um, they have been submitted as of yesterday to Jack. Um, the, the one issue we faced was that the trial enrolled a small subset of patients prior to registration in the clinicaltrials.gov site. Uh, and so we had sequential submissions to journals that after a, a period of time threw out, the, threw out the paper and wouldn't do it, even though it's there now, and it was there after about two a third of the patients, um, uh, they wouldn't accept the paper. So we've been through iterations of that. <clears throat> In terms of the documentation of atrial fibrillation, ablation success, uh, specifically what did the uh, trial uh, monitor arrhythmias? Was it uh, transtelephonic? How long was it? There were, there were holders. Uh, Several, I forget how many. There were trans tel tel two holders, trans monitors looking for both symptomatic TTMs and weekly asymptomatic TTMs. And for how long? For the nine One month year. follow up. So every weekly. So there were 35 median per patient. <laughs> and one, one thing in all the slides that had maps. Um, this is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We're thinking about only pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, but a lot of the maps that I saw in your presentation had more <coughs> lesions and just pulmonary vein isolation by catheter. Um, in the CARTO maps that, that we saw, there were lesions from the left incision to the mitral annulus through the ablation catheter. That, that one I can explain. And, and so can you explain the procedure that you're arguing here? Uh, so that patient. Uh, was originally done as part of the continued access protocol over two years ago and represented uh, about a month ago with a mitral isthmus flutter. There were no lesions done other than the veins at that time. So that map was done as a voltage map after we had just treated his mitral isthmus flutter. But the veins were still isolated at two years. Okay. Dear, dear honors, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear Ellen, I'm an interventional electrophysiologist for, yeah, meanwhile, almost 30 years, uh, mainly driven by, by uh, innovations in the field of catheter ablation. As I will share with you in, in a couple of minutes from now, I had, the, I had the privilege to do the first ablations with radio frequency currents 25, 25 years ago and did studies with, with, some, impact, uh, with some impact on, on the field. I always was interested in, in new technologies. I always was open in, in new technologies. Look to, to my center, the Heart Center in Leipzig. It is one of the most innovative cardiovascular centers, one of the most innovative EP centers you can find, you can find worldwide. There's hardly any, hardly any technique or technology in the field of catheter ablation that is not going through our hands for careful evaluation in order to prove or disprove whether it represents an incremental benefit to our patients. Cryo also went that, that path and, and, and failed to convince us that it represents a significant step forward. What is the, the key question of the case today? The key question of the case today is not whether 
you may do radiofrequency ablation or you may do cryoablation to treat paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. The question as it has been set up is, is cryoablation superior to radiofrequency ablation and are there any data, any data, that suggest that it is a good idea to start in first-line therapy with cryo rather than doing it with, with uh, radiofrequency ablation. I was involved in, I, I think, every guideline in, in AF and consensus statement in AF that, that has uh, been published over the last couple of years. And I cannot recall, I cannot recall a single, a single meaningful discussion in that sense that somebody approached the group and said, hey, I have an idea, let's put cryo first line. And if you look to the, to the uh, consensus statement paper, if you look to the ESC guidelines, if you look to the update as I would expect them, I can't talk about that as I would expect them, I don't think that you will find any evidence and any hint to follow that suggestion. It was interesting to listen uh, to Ellen, and I respect her very much. And it was even more interesting to listen to our witnesses. One witness, is, witness enjoyed us with case reports in order to, to, to support the position. Interesting cases, but not meaningful for the key question. And the, the other witness enjoyed us with unpublished data, which is also <laughs> difficult to get along with. I'm working in, in one of the most busiest EP uh, centers uh, in Europe, if not worldwide. We will exceed, exceed 2,500 ablation procedures per year at the Heart Center in Leipzig. You see the numbers here for AF procedures and for, for VT procedures, which are the key elements of what, what we are doing now, and it's the key element of what we're going to do in the future. We will, we will do more than 1,300 AF cases in 2012, in four labs in two shifts. So AF is one of the most important parts of, of our business. I'm innovative. I'm open to new technologies. I'm not that stupid. So if there is a technology that offers significant benefit, shorter procedures, less fluoroscopy time, good outcome for the patients, I wouldn't be stupid enough not to implement that into our workflow. Why didn't we do so? And this is the, this is the key question. Why didn't we, as well as almost all other key centers worldwide, did not do so? Because we are not convinced. And the, the, the stop AF data are, are everything else but convincing in the sense whether cryoablation is first line, is first line therapy. Radiofrequency energy has driven us for 25 years. I have seen energy sources, techniques and technologies coming and going. The first balloon, the first balloon technology that was put into the market was, was uh, introduced by the smart guy Michael Lesh. He made millions with that, but never anything came out. We will review other technologies in, in the field and will we'll then very, very balanced and carefully evaluate the role, of, the role of cryo. Point by point radio frequency ablation stayed over 25 years. It's first line therapy, AV node reentrant tachycardia, tachycardia due to accessory pathways, ectopic atrial tachycardia, typical atypical atrial flutter, ventricular arrhythmias. It is safe, it is reliable. We know what we are doing with radio frequency energy. It's well controllable in educated and good hands, yes. But it is as it is. Radiofrequency ablation, uh, radiofrequency uh, ablation energy is, and, and, and admitted that, is the most frequently used energy source in the field, and it will stay that way. Different devices and technologies aiming on pulmonary vein ablation. It was interesting to, to learn from one of the witnesses that he was surprised that no dissociated potentials can be seen in many cases treated with cryoenergy. Yes, I had the same experience. And you know what the reason is? 
that the, the, the lesions are very distal. You freeze the focus down rather than dissociating the focus by circumferential ablation. With all techniques and technologies where you do not see dissociated potentials, there is evidence that you are very, very distal, very, very segmental in what you're doing. And that is one of my key points. With cryo and balloon technology, you end up with segmental pulmonary vein ablation. Let's look what happened to the other pulmonary vein-based technologies. Not our key topic, but it, it, it is of interest in, in, uh, in that respect. Ablation frontiers, 40% silent stroke is dead. Mesh ablated, 10% success rate has been recently published is dead. HIFU, significant complication rate is, is dead. Cardiofocus, to me, no significant benefits. And then we, have, then we have cryo. And I tell you, I've worked with all these energy sources. I think I'm among the few people in that room that has had it all in the hands and has treated patients with all of these energy sources. And none of them has been implemented in, uh, in our workflow. What counts if we, if we, if we judge on the, the usefulness of a therape therapeutic uh, strategy? Conceptual aspects and ablation strategy, procedural aspects surely count, procedure time is one of the most strongest incentives for physicians to use a technology. It's interesting, but it's the truth. It's even more, it's even stronger than, than efficiency rate. Fluoroscopy time is, a, is an issue. Safety and efficiency, of course, is an, is an, uh, is an issue. And I was a little bit surprised by by listening to one of the witnesses explaining us the, the, the beautiful outcome of the STOP AF trial, but not sharing with us the true complication rate which has been observed in STOP AF, which is worrisome with strokes and other significant complications. Development of, uh, of competing technologies plays a role. All these techniques, technologies are competitive. What is the problem with all the devices that are pulmonary vein segmental isolation oriented? That if you use them, you become a slave of the anatomy. The left atrium of, the, of our patients is, is, is like the face of, uh, of a patient. Every left atrium is individual. And in order to keep up with the individual needs and requirements for treatment, you have to be able to individualize and personalize therapy. I will come to that point again because I believe in the future personalized treatment strategies will even play a more important role. With point-by-point -point radiofrequency ablation, you are able to adjust to the individual needs and requirements of your patients. Regardless whether there's a common osteum, regardless whether there are four or five ostea of the pulmonary vein. You simply can do that. You can't do that with cryoenergy. Coming back to the point of sites of pulmonary vein isolation, circumferential enteral pulmonary vein isolation versus segmental trigger-oriented pulmonary vein isolation. And it's true, if you deliver your ablation energy close to the, to the vein, you end up with a silent vein. But this is, this is a true sign of a very distal lesion. Vivek Reddy has also worked with all these technologies. And this, is, this has been taken from Vivek, where he analyzed where do these techniques and technologies, and that included laser, cryo, hyphu, where, where do they isolate the veins? Very, very distal. And that is the true reason why these techniques are getting weaker and weaker the more advanced the disease, the electrical disease of atrial fibrillation is. When it comes from early paroxysmal to longer paroxysmal episodes to persistent atrial fibrillation, the efficiency of all these technologies rapidly, rapidly goes down. What are the current radiofrequency-driven uh, 
point-by-point -point ablation strategies. Its primary vein isolation on an antral level, as shown on these slides, in 30 to 40 percent, if you treat the patient this way, you see isolated potentials. Beautiful. You see atrial fibrillation running in the veins. Beautiful. Because it shows that you stay antral. You leave the veins untouched. And that's a conceptual difference to balloon-based ablation. Going to, to individualized therapies, I personally believe that the, the treatment strategy that we, that we are applying now for patients with atrial fibrillation to the pulmonary veins in paroxysmals, do something else in persistent, will change in, uh, in the near future. Because the, 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 the uh, classification of patients to paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing persistent, does not reflect the substrate of the patient. It's a clinical, it's a clinical classification. So when you, when, you, when you analyze the substrate of the patients, you immediately or you very quickly learn that, that we have patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that have a partially diseased left atrium. These are voltage maps from the left atrium of patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. The veins are isolated, but you see a strand here of fibrotic and diseased tissue. And with radiofrequency energy, you recognize that, and you work on that substrate, which is not possible with balloon-based strategies. The next case is even, is even more striking. A patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation Voltage map, the gray areas represent scar and the, the uh, yellow and red colors indicate patient with low voltages. It's an advanced stage of disease in a patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. According to my, my knowledge in the field, I would give a pulmonary vein-oriented strategy in these patients only zero chance to succeed. So the treatment strategy need to be adopted according to the, to the individual substrate. And with radiofrequency energy, we can do so, and we do so in a significant number of uh, patients, even with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. When it comes to left atrial macroreentral tachycardia, you are really short if you use, if you use cryoenergy, because then you have to completely change your setup. Take the cryocatheter out, take a radiofrequency catheter, or at least a touch-up catheter with, uh, with cryo, conventional cryocatheter. Anybody in the room who has completed a, a roof line with a, with a uh, touch-up catheter with cryo? Nobody? It's damn difficult, if not impossible. Try to kill the left atrial isthmus with a cryocatheter. Try to do it. But take a huge time window in order to, to, uh, to try to succeed. It's not possible. With radiofrequency energy, as shown in this example, it's easy. Left atrial macroreentral tachycardia, you map it. You don't have to change anything. Septal substrate, you apply a lesion line. The cycle length changes. You recognize that. You do a remap, and uh, you continue the case. You move from the left atrium to the right atrium. You, you do a, a linear lesion from the superior cable vein all along the, the right atrial free wall, and you, you successfully, you successfully uh, complete the case. With a single catheter, with a single energy source, it's really, it's really uh, driven by success, radiofrequency catheter ablation. I'd like to share with you now some of the, the assumptions that are always discussed when it comes to the question cryo. Assumption number one, cryo ablation is as effective as radiofrequency ablation. I come back to witness number two. Witness number two did something which is, when it comes to science, not allowed. You cannot, you cannot head to head compare studies with different patient population, different endpoints, different definitions. It has significant limitations. I'm one of the editors in the European, in the European Heart Journal, and I know how to, to handle these issues. It is scientifically not allowed. We need a head-to-head -head comparison between the two energy sources in order to prove or to disprove whether there is superiority of, uh, of uh, cryoablation. 
This has never been shown by means of a prospective randomized study performed in centers that are experienced in the use of point-by-point -point radio frequency uh, ablation, not even in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So we are very far away from any evidence that, that uh, radio frequency, that cryoablation is superior. Radio frequency ablation of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We talk about five year follow up. Data from Hamburg, data from Bordeaux, data from the United States, from the, the Cleveland Clinic Group. Look at this. Needless to say, 1.2 to 1.5 radio frequency ablations per patient, but 80% cure freedom from atrial fibrillation, to put it into more careful words, at five years. I'm not, I do not believe that, that uh, cryo comes even close to these results. Cryo balloon ablation is as safe or even safer as compared to radio frequency ablation. For, for years there were rumors that there are no, no oesophageal lesions with, uh, with cryo energy. Two years ago, two years ago, the, the uh, New York group of Vivek Reddy and, and Andre Davila published data with a 25% incidence of oesophageal lesions with cryo. You can read it up in, in the Heart Rhythm Journal. And now we have the first cases of uh, fistula, as we unfortunately have seen with radio frequency energy. But Ellen's conclusion that the risks are so much different is not supported by the data. We have it on both sides. No data support this assumption. Reported data indicate that complication rates may be higher as compared to radio frequency energy. Let's look, uh, take a look to the data. Ellen was kind enough to, to quote our study, 1,000 consecutive procedures, a 100% follow-up. No patient lost a follow-up, 890, 890 patients. And it's true, we are highly interventional with catheter ablation. And there are complications on the radio frequency ablation side, no, no doubt about it. It's 4%, and there are few but devastating complications, very few devastating complications that we see. We have to work to reduce them, but there are no data indicating that we will not see them with cryo. Look to the STOP AF. Stroke is devastating, 2.5%. TIA, 1.8%. Tamponade. It's all there. It's all in there. And if you sum that up, you come to a complication rate of 18% in that study. So the conclusion that this energy source is safer than radio frequency current is not supported by structurally correct acquired data. The next argument in favor of, of cryo is, well, let's take the, the young and the healthy. There it works. And we shouldn't go at, take any risks for this, this population of patients. Let's do cryo. It may be less effective, but it may be safer as well. Look to the data. These are data, radio frequency ablation of atrial fibrillation in the hands of uh, Jonathan Kerman from, from Australia, reporting in 500 consecutive low-risk patients a complication rate which is below 1%, 500 patients consecutively. The, the transesophageal echocardiogram was more dangerous than radio frequency ablation in that particular study. Assumption number three, atrioesophageal fistula does not occur. We touched that point. I will speed up a little bit and come to the next point. Assumption number four, cry Cryoablation is faster than radio frequency ablation. Again, let's take a look to, to, the, uh, to the STOP IF trial. No data support this assumption. Reported data indicate that cryo may take longer as compared to radio frequency ablation. In the, in the STOP IF trial, 371 minutes. I do at least two, if not three, radio frequency cases in that time window. <laughs> Fluoroscopy time, fluoroscopy time, more than one hour, 62 minutes. I mean, these data, they are on the table, and we cannot ne neglect them and say, hey, it's, that was an early, unexperienced group. No, it's, this is not true, because the, the centers involved were experienced centers in interventional electrophysiology. Repeat ablation, 19%. 
What's new in point-by-point -point radio frequency ablation? I would like to make a case in favor of radio frequency ablation. We will see new electrodes that will even further improve the ability of radio frequency current to induce durable lesions. We will see new mapping technologies uh, that will improve our capabilities to be faster and be safer with radio frequency currents. New technologies like contact sensing are in the stage of clinical implementation that will further incre increase the efficiency and the safety of the procedure. Cryo energy versus radio frequency energy. My last three slides. There have been attempts to, to, uh, to settle cryo a little bit in the, in the uh, ablation field of so-called conventional arrhythmias, easy arrhythmias as well, for atrial flutter, for AVNRT. There are a couple of randomized prospective studies. They, they, the studies had all the same outcome. The study confirmed the superiority of radio frequency energy as compared to cryo energy. There's, without a single exception, the key finding was that there's a higher recurrence rate in, in, in cryo with the same complication rate. This supports this point of view that the, durab that the durability of lesions is different. These are patients following radio frequency, intraoperative radio frequency ablation of atrial fibrillation and cryoablation of atrial fibrillation, ones that had recurrences of left atrial macroenteral tachycardia. And the interesting thing is, it's, it's not surprising because they all had recurrences that, that we end up at 100% at, uh, at recurrence in this subset of patients. But the interesting thing is, is the time cause. The time cause, it occurs earlier, significantly earlier with cryoenergy, rising evidence that the lesions are different. My second last slide, comparing cryo with radio frequency energy for clinical application in the clinical setting, what you can do with one energy source and what you can do with the other energy source, or what you can do with one and you can't do with the other. You can treat all types of AF with cryo, no. With radio frequency energy, yes, certainly. Individualized ablation that I believe becomes one of the key strategies in the next years. You can't do it with cryo. You are a slave of the anatomy you can do with radio frequency energy. Antral ablation with cryo, you stay in at the pulmonary vein site. With radio frequency energy, you have the liberty to, to select for every patient the best treatment. Mapping capabilities, nothing with a balloon, full capabilities with radio frequency energy. When it comes to atrial flutter, you simply do it with radio frequency energy. You can't do it with cryo. And fluoroscopic navigation, of course you can do it with radio frequency energy. It's one of the key technologies supporting your procedure, but you can't do it uh, with cryo. My last slide. Why did cryoablation not evolve as a key ablation strategy in, hi in high volume ablation centers? Carlo Papone the Bordeaux group, Leipzig group, other groups. Why not? Because the guys there are stupid? No, I don't think so. Because there is consensus that there are significant differences with respect to the, to the energy sources, that there is a lower efficiency rate as compared to radio frequency energy ablation in experienced sense, and that the complication rates are equivalent for both energy sources. Point-by-point -point radio frequency ablation does enable individualized treatment, enable safe and more efficient lesion deployment. I'm convinced that this is the case. Allows innovative 3, 4D catheter navigation and will, if all technologies which are in the pipeline now at the end implemented, allow procedure durations of less than 120 minutes door in, door out, radiation time less than 10 minutes, and an efficiency rate of more than 80%. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I will confess that I personally use both energy source, 
but I will show you why the statement that cryoablation is the best approach for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is a premature statement. Oh, actually, it should be the 10 top reasons. Hmm, I don't know why it shows up this way. Okay. There are 10 top reasons that cryo balloon ablation is not the best approach for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Number one, we often need identification and ablation of other non PV foci. Number two, we frequently need touch up RF or focal cryoablation with freezer max or after cryo balloon ablation. There is significant risk of frantic nerve injury and not a non insignificant risk of uh, pulmonary vein stenosis. And it may not be suitable for a small sized person, especially uh, since the, the tools are, uh, are significantly larger. There are complications and risk associated with contrast dye and also higher, uh, longer uh, fluoroscopic uh, uh, exposures. And as other speakers have mentioned earlier, there's really no advantage of procedural efficacy over RF. And there's, no, there's inability using cryo balloon to perform any electrogram based uh, ablation such as CAFE or the uh, firm uh, uh, mapping, focal uh, impulse and the rotor modulation. And autonomic based uh, intervention is not possible. And is it really cost effective? I know there's not a lot of uh, data on that, but uh, you know, if you had to pull out a second RF catheter or, or even a freezer max and uh, doing touch ups, I don't think this, it's not going to be as cost effective as, uh, as, R, as uh, RF. And for repeat procedures, um, if it's anything that's uh, a non pulmonary foci, uh, then it's also not very feasible. I also want to say that, um, um, you know, we need to re remind ourselves that the cryo balloon is a single tool designed to treat a single uh, condition, which is a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation using a single strategy, which is a more distal pulmonary vein isolation. And this is a single centered uh, experience demonstrating many, many, many other non-pulmonary foci as high as 16%. And in these uh, several other studies suggesting that other um, non, other SVTs such as, such as atrial tachycardia or even the reentry accounts for at least four to five percent of the uh, of the triggers that of atrial fibrillation. Of course, it comes from other uh, maybe as as high as twenty some percent from the SVC ligament marshal, and many of them come from posterior left atrium or the free wall and crystal terminalis and in many other areas that's not possible. Uh, to be targeted with uh, with uh, cryo balloon, and um, I just show that this is a uh, uh, an AV nodal reentry goes into uh, an AFib, and this is a uh, septal pa uh, uh, accessory pathway septal pathway that goes into AFib, and there's no advantage in terms of uh, uh, the overall um, uh, efficacy. And if you just look at some of the, the data here, and I try to uh, uh, separate them to cryo versus RF, and uh, um, this include uh, 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 Kapato's uh, you know, large, these are patients with the proxismal AFib out of his original study. But the efficacies are really uh, not any better, okay? Maybe a little bit less compared to, uh, compared to RF with a fairly significant complication rate. Uh, and that's not even including the, 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 the risk of strokes and other TIAs. And relatively speaking, the uh, large studies suggesting that the, the RF is probably a, uh, a better modality. So I think that, uh, I think that the, the statement that the cryo balloon should be the, the be is the best treatment for, uh, for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is premature. I think that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation does include a spectrum of diseases, uh, as other speakers have shown earlier, that, uh, that include the left atrium that are fairly normal and, or, and left atrium that have extensive scarring. And cryo balloon would not be able to take care of any of these problems. So thank you very much. I don't even have to use any slides because I think that the arguments made on my side have been very, very convincing. So a couple of things, you know, all of us have conflicts of interest and the fact that I have a conflict of interest and the fact that my cryo console may be taken away from my lab tomorrow, <laughs> I would like to move a motion to the court 
that the case presented by the other side should be dismissed and decided in our favor. All the arguments should be dismissed by the other side. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll keep continue the argument. You know. <laughs> so 22 years ago, I was inflating balloons. I was an interventional cardiologist. Uh, you know, it was too boring. There was nothing to think, and I became a cardi electrophysiologist. And 22 years later, I'm told that go ahead and inflate the balloon again, and everything will be okay. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to me. Now, you know, the arguments in 14 years I've been doing AF ablation. I've had one patient with pulmonary vein stenosis. 3.1% rate of pulmonary vein stenosis? Come on. You want to do that procedure and tell that to your patients that there's a 3% chance of pulmonary vein stenosis? You can make a sumo wrestler shrink and a smaller circle bigger, but you can't hide behind the facts so from the standpoint of that. So the arguments presented by the other side are incomplete as compared to my friend who presented an excellent case. The arguments presented by the other side were deceptive and they sucked. So that's, <laughs> I, that's my case. I will um, ask my associated justice if they have any questions for the protagonist. Um, one of the reasons that you said that the complication rate was high was the frequency of phrenic nerve uh, uh, injury. And uh, the protagonists have said that this is uh, largely reversible. What is the reversibility of RF-induced phrenic nerve uh, injury? There are good data from, from the Bordeaux group showing that uh, the, the time window to recovery may be a little bit longer as compared to, to uh, cryoblation, but there is an almost 100% recovery as well. It may take six months, which are difficult for the patients uh, affected. But that, that's true for both sides. Don't you think that <coughs> the uh, balloon procedure is simpler and maybe applied in a less experienced center? Yes, that is, that is one of the few arguments in favor of, of that technology. It is, it is simpler uh, and uh, it may be, may be easier to handle in unexperienced hands, but I, I have my problems to, to recommend that because we are talking about uh, high-end interventional electrophysiology and that is uh, as a rule, nothing for, for unexperienced hands. I will ask the uh, protagonist to give some time for Roberta and tell. Um, I have really felt more comfortable with cryo than now uh, after I've heard the arguments. And my only explanation that these centers that you just called as reference, your own high volume centers and others, that they haven't gone for a cryoablation is that you didn't have the experience. Because it's such a straightforward and, uh, uh, and easy to handle uh, 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 ablation procedure. And, uh, you can't, and, and we have to face with all these patients. So you can't have all the AF patient load uh, concentrated uh, in Europe to five centers. And I think the problem is that you never got enough experience with cryo. If you have done over 600 procedures, it's fun. This is really the fun procedure as with circular mapping. You didn't mention that parameter. It's the first time we can define a time to isolation parameter for procedural and long-term success, which is not available with any of the other technologies that you mentioned. And I would like to formally invite you now to participate, and that is not what you mentioned, the head-to-head -head comparison of the freeze cohort study. You know that we do a worldwide study comparing head-to-head -head 2,000 RF patients and 2,000 cryo patients. And the RF arm is lacking. So we would very much enjoy to have your very high volume and very experienced. We're still stunned with your experience, by the way. But so it would be, it would probably add a tremendous value to that study if you would participate. And you know also that Karl Heinz Cook from Hamburg started at the same time a randomized comparison, 
a study that is called Fire and Ice. So we are facing, I think next time, uh, next year this time, we probably can present first head-to-head -head data. And you are very formally invited now to participate. Thank you. Can I, Your Honor, can I reply to that right now? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, we still, can we still have more rebuttal? Yeah. Of course. So I think we've got a couple more minutes. I, I would now I will give all of you insights into, into the, the internal structure of the Heart Center Leipzig. We have uh, 160 people working in, in interventional electrophysiology. We have 50 physicians working in interventional uh, electrophysiology, 11 consultants. And I tell you that because I, I called all the consultants to, to discuss whether or not we, we're going to give it another try to go into the cryo business. We, we did it two times. And I, I try to encourage them because I want, I think it's important that we as a radio frequency experience center participate in the, in the fire and ice study, giving, giving really experience on the, on the radio frequency side or in your study as well. But I couldn't find a single, a single colleague, a single colleague that said, hey, I'm gonna jump on, I'm gonna do that. Everybody I talked to from our consultant said, not, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. Then, because I, you're afraid. I, I hired, no, no, no. <laughs> then I hired, I hired a guy from Rotterdam, the guy you had, you had on, on, your, uh, on your slides, Ivan Bell, has done hundreds of, of, uh, of cryo cases in Rotterdam. And he was two months with us, and then he completely turned to radio frequency energy. And over, over 16 months, well, he who stayed. Wouldn't in your over department? 16 months, he stayed with us. He did, he did five cryo cases, and he had all freedoms. I, I, I gave a complete, a complete cath lab for the cryo project. But once you know how to handle radio frequency energy, the incentives to go for cryo are poor. Dr. Kau. So, um, going back to the, the, the data and, and leaving the opinion. Um, yes, the STOP AF trial hasn't been published. We wish it had by now. But the FDA, I would, sub, uh, I would submit that despite the fact that in the room the FDA is probably not considered highly, their scrutiny of the FDA is probably far better than the scrutiny of two reviewers at any journal out there, um, no matter which journal. Um, and so let's look at what the FDA has said. Um, our, our, our esteemed colleagues on the opposition said that uh, RF is driven by success. We know that. RF is driven by success at one center in the world. We didn't see any discussion of the fact that in the largest randomized study that the FDA looked at of RF ablation versus drugs, everyone else but one place was sub 50% in success. There was no discussion of why that is. I left off the discussion of complications in that trial, we should look at the numbers. The FDA has shown them. They're in slides. Just Google FDA and Thermocool, and you will see numbers that exceed 15% in complication rate. We didn't hear any of that. So uh, furthermore, we didn't bring up macro reentrant atrial tachycardies. They did. We didn't bring it up because they only occur in 3% of cryo cases. They occur in far higher percentage of cases with radio frequency. We also didn't bring up uh, durable PVI because Vivek Reddy showed in the only study taking everyone back at 12 weeks that 88% of veins are still isolated 10 weeks after a cryoablation procedure. I've never seen an RF case ablation study where you have that degree of durable PVI. Um, so I think the only thing I'd ask is if all these great centers don't like cryo, why haven't they published any data about why they don't like cryo? Uh, I would um, take exception to the length of the procedure. The, the number of 371 from the STOP AFib trial is how we defined the procedure, which was the moment they came into the room, the clock started. They were required to have a TEE done in the room, which was part of the procedure. Uh, we had to wait 30 minutes after the last freeze and if you chose to do a mitral flutter line, we had to use the freezer max, which I will, uh, 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 yeah, a CTI line uh, with freezer max, and I will, I will submit that that's painfully slow uh, at four minutes. So 
had we been able to use saline cooled RF for the CTI line, or if they had just counted the time from beginning of the skin, ablation of the pulmonary veins, it would have been a lot shorter than 371 minutes. And the clock didn't start until the patient was awoken from anesthesia, the sheaths were pulled, and they were out of the room. So I routinely do uh, two cryoballoon ablations a day, and I'm usually done with both of them by one o'clock, even pulling the sheaths in the room. Um, the second argument, or the second thing I would like to address is you're absolutely right that if you have to do a mitral line, um, you need to put another catheter in. Um, it's very unusual that I have to use a mitral line, um, but would I rather use a cryo balloon and a freezer max? The distance, when you look at the distance from the left inferior to the, tri to the mitral annulus, it's about a centimeter and a half. And it's not uncommon that I then have to put that freezer max inside the uh, coronary sinus and ablate in the coronary sinus. So would you rather pick a cryo balloon and a freezer max catheter or an RF catheter and an angioplasty catheter to fix the circumflex that you just closed? Uh, I just want to remind the audience that the um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation uh, may not, there are emerging evidence suggesting that the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation may not be just due to pulmonary vein triggers. They are the other focal triggers and uh, rotors and things like that as, uh, being that's being uh, presented at this meeting. So uh, an acquired balloon will not be able to deal with any of these other perhaps new emergent evidence and mechanism of atrial fibrillation. Right there. Just a, a last sentence on, on one of the arguments that was brought up. Uh, the the uh, observation of, from Vivek Reddy were quoted by the protagonist side, uh, indicating that there is an 88% pulmonary vein isolation rate. Yeah, yes, but on, on, on which level? Vivek was, was able to show the same, exactly the same for, uh, for ablation with a the, with the laser uh, device. And the interesting, the interesting, wait a second. The interesting thing is, although the pulmonary veins are isolated due to the distal nature of the isolation, the recurrence rate of atrial fibrillation remains high. That's the key message. And it's pretty much in line with what I explained to you on the importance of the site of pulmonary vein isolation, antral or segmental. And with cryo, we are segmental. Dr. Tra? I don't have to say anything. Dr. Hendricks has made an excellent case that the location of the isolation is important. If you're going to isolate the vein, you're not going to see any potential. If you're going to isolate the muscle, you may see sometimes potential. Do you have any other comments? Uh, may I comment? Yes. I think you might I have missed that wonderful data from Imperial College. And uh, of course, cryo-balloon ablation is far from being segmental. It's when you take the large balloon, which is 28 millimeters, and you angulate different branches of the pulmonary vein, you do quite a bit of substrate modification, and the MRI studies will exactly show that you have quite an enteral ablation, in particular with the large balloon. So segmental uh, ablation is objected, Your Honor. And, and in fact, with that catheter, what you see in most veins is a independently firing pulmonary vein at 40 beats per minute when you've achieved isolation or termination of atrial fibrillation with fibrillation in the vein ongoing. So you can see potentials in those veins. Why do you have 11% phrenic nerve injury if you are so austere, even if it's acute? Uh, I think you have to, to differentiate uh, phrenic nerve injury. If you have a 10% rate of phrenic nerve attenuation during the procedure, and we developed safety uh, measures during the procedure, we were pacing the phrenic nerve. Uh, it, almost all of them, as I showed you from our own experience now, over 600 procedures uh, resolve within a minute. So I wouldn't call that phrenic nerve injury. There's very rare cases, and they're below 1% that don't resolve within the procedure. And there's only one case in our 600 procedures that didn't resolve within a year. So injury, uh, phrenic nerve attenuation, uh, temporarily for a few minutes, I wouldn't call that injury. But that was not the question. 
even if it's an acute attenuation, and if you are so enteral, it should not occur. Well, the, the, the reason is, is when you look at the lesion that we create, it's very wide. When you looked at that inside of the left atrium or you look at the cardio voltage mapping, it's not a discrete little line. It's a very wide thing going from the antrum all the way to the ostium of the pulmonary vein. Okay, so we'll remember the audience that the question is, is cryoablation the best approach for the treatment of paroxysmal AFib? And what we would like to do is to fool the audience, and you guys are going to make this decision based on the protagonist and the antagonist, which both have been fantastic presentations and discussions. And is cryoablation the best approach for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and who supports the protagonists? <laughs> How about if the cryo people move here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. And let's raise a hands on who supports the antagonists. <laughs> I think it's a 50-50, <laughs> which is a, a Solomonic uh, judgment. <laughs> well, I think and, that this is clear. I mean, I think that, 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 that we, we have a split on this decision. Yes, do we have to come back next year? Exactly. And, and we need more data and we need yes. more studies that, that will help us understand better what we're doing. I think it's clear that in experienced centers with RF, it is the method of choice, and their experience center with cryo, that, that's their method of choice. So I think it's clear here, and I apologize, please, are there any questions from the audience, please, before we make the decision? <laughs> <laughs> so um, my name is Miran Jabarza. I was trained by Dr. Sra, uh, and um, I just wanted to tell you my perspective. I am in a private practice. I do use both cryoablation and uh, RF ablation. And uh, my experience is not long enough to tell you which one is better from my standpoint, but I just tell you what I think the pros and cons uh, of cryo and RF is from perspective of a private uh, practitioner who's working in a community hospital. Um, the um, cryoablation, the, the pros of cryoablation, I think it's a single transeptal. And what I do after isolation of the vein, whether it's cryo or RF, I demonstrate and document the exit and entrance block to the vein. So uh, we, and then I uh, uh, give, uh, you know, small dose of uh, isoprotrenol, and then I can go up to 20 mics and and so I wait, and I, I really uh, try to do a thorough job. So the pros of um, uh, cryo is that we um, do a single transeptal, and uh, if once you get to the, the, you pass that learning curve after, you know, 10 or 15 cases, then uh, you, you learn how to really wedge the balloon in the vein, and we, I always use the big, bigger balloon, um, and monitor the diaphragm, monitor the phrenic nerve, both with pacing the phrenic nerve and also monitoring the amplitude of the phrenic EGM. Um, uh, we haven't had any issues with the uh, diaphragmatic problem. We, I've had none, no, zero uh, problems with that. And it, I can easily, I can tell you, I can easily do like three, at least three AFib ablations with cryo a day and uh, with, for paroxysmal AFib. And as I said, demonstrating entrance and exit block, I pace from all the, uh, that circular catheters, every pole at uh, you know, high voltage. And um, the patient has, is under conscious sedation. We don't need to uh, do general anesthesia for it. So that's, and so far, so good. Uh, obviously, the, the cons of it is that if, if you 
when, when we induce AFib, if I find, you know, that I, have, I need to give a lesion at, you know, in the coronary sinus or somewhere else, obviously we have to pull the thermocool, and that's the uh, cause. But I think if we, for so far, for the, if we catch the patients at early stage, early paroxysmal stage, you know, doing uh, uh, cryoablation is, is very good. I, I favor it, doing it. You can do it very quick, and the patient has faster recovery, and it's, uh, it's at least yeah. as safe as RF. Mehra, just one thing. I think we need to retrain you again. <laughs> <laughs> you did a wonderful job the first time. <laughs> I think your, your argument is the same as what we've heard today. I mean, I don't think that doing it extra transeptal is a big deal. I don't think that's a seller to use a cryo balloon or not. Uh, it takes one minute to do an extra transeptal puncture. I, I don't see that as a limitation factor. I, again, so far, you prefer cryo balloon and mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. will listen to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the argument of doing three cryos in a day, I've done three paroxysmals in a day with RF. And so I think you can do it from either strategy. My question really focuses, and, and I wanted to ask the speakers and the witnesses as well, with the use of pre and concurrent uh, cardiac imaging in the role of MRI or CT, has your use gone down or up? With advancements in 3D electronatomic mapping, I would, I would uh, hope to hear that from the antagonist side that they would be using less, and then maybe from the cryo side that they'd be using more, but I'm very curious to hear what everyone thinks. So, so the, the, the question is that the I can probably start on my side, if I may, you know. We do, uh, we've been doing CTs from day one on every patient we take for AF. And we did a survey that, so there are two things here, two steps here. One is a pre-procedure and one is intra-procedure, and obviously the post-procedure. So when you look at, and that's what one of the things was that which bothers me a little bit, when you look at consecutive, we looked at like almost 700 consecutive CT scans on patients, that there is a almost a nine-fold inter-patient variations in the pulmonary vein anatomy. So, every ninth patient will have a different anatomy. And intra-patient variability is almost 100%. You know, so you will never see all the four veins the same. You'll see sometimes a common left vein. You know, Dr. Hendrick showed a beautiful picture of that. Sometimes there are three veins on the right side, sometimes there are four veins on the left side. And so one thing fits all becomes a problem, you know, essentially. We, we, whatever we say, it's a problem, you know. And so I think that that's, that's very, very critical. Whatever energy source you use, that you need to know the anatomy of the patient. And that may be the reason, you know, that we have not had a problem with pulmonary vein stenosis. In, in 14 years, we have been doing that, except one pulmonary vein, inferior vein stenosis in one patient, you know, essentially, in 14 years. And then is the intra-procedural. And you, will, you see that, you know, you're going to see more and more of this thing, that there will be integration of these modalities with fluoroscopy and echocardiography. So whether you know you are a cryo proponent or an RF proponent, I think it gives you a much more safety margin. It gives you much more uh, room to maneuver your catheters where you're going, and I'll, it will help you from that standpoint. So I think that the imaging, if anything, is going to become more important rather than less important, no matter what you use. Um. We did uh, an imaging technology in each of our patients because uh, if you do cryo balloon ablation, the sizing of the balloon is critical for success. So for planning the procedure, if you have, it's important to know if you have a left common os or you know you have just heard how variable the anatomy is. So it's very helpful. We did either rotational angiography, MRI, or CT, but in each patient. And uh, you saw that we use the small balloon in a lot of cases, which is, uh, is maybe very special for our center, but explains the high efficacy. 
it is very tedious and can be challenging to position the large balloon like in the left inferior, which is very oval. We just published our analysis with the ovality index. Uh, the left, left inferior pulmonary vein is very frequently uh, very oval, uh, not round uh, position, which is challenging for the big balloon. So to know the anatomy prior to the procedure and during, of course, during the procedure is very helpful. We do that always. In the future, uh, the imaging companies will help us to simplify the, uh, the will, will, the imaging will improve so we don't have to do a pre-procedural uh, CT scan or MRI. So I think in the future with rotational angiography, less radiation, we can it intra-procedural, we can do an intra-procedural sizing. And the only other thing I'd add is when we are doing our typical paroxysmal case, we're not using a mapping system. And stop AF mapping systems were prohibited from the trial. Okay. But we still do imaging. Thank you very much. It's excellent. And uh, have a good meeting. <laughs>